Okay, um, the 2024 John Dirks Canada Gairdner Global Health Award awardee is Dr. Cherry Kang. Dr. Kang received her training in medicine and microbiology at the Christian Medical College, Vellore in Southern India. She is professor of microbiology at CMC, where her research group has established substantial community-based birth cohort studies addressing childhood enteric infections, growth and development over 20 years. Using data and insights from these studies alongside immunological, mechanistic, epidemiological, and implementation research, Professor Kang has generated extensive information on the complex interactions between the environment and infections in children and the influence of prior infections on subsequent responses to vaccination. As a physician scientist, Professor Kang has led studies that contributed to the development and introduction of two Indian rotavirus vaccines into the National Immunization Program. These uh, vaccines are now WHO pre-qualified and their introduction has begun in countries outside India. She has expanded her research and collaborations to work on other enteric pathogens, particularly cholera and typhoid, with a view to further vaccine introductions on nutritional and pharmacological interventions aimed at improving oral vaccine efficacy and on the transmission and impact of a vaccine effectiveness for COVID-19 in the Indian context. Recently, Dr. Kang has also joined the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as Director, Enterics Diagnostics, Genomics and Epidemiology. The 2024 John Dirks Canada Gardner Global Health Awardee, Dr. Cherry Kang, will present her presentation India for the World, the Story of Rotavirus Vaccines. Please welcome Dr. Ken. Thank you. Um, I know it's been a while, so can I just ask if everybody can just stand up and turn around a couple of times in honor of the rotavirus, wheel-shaped virus, right? Okay. Right. So thank you very much. Um, I'd particularly like to thank the Gedner Foundation for recognizing work in enteric infections and work that has been done in India. I have a problem recruiting people to my group because quite honestly to get people to work in an area that labels itself as trying to solve problems of children, and particularly diarrhea, does not appeal to stellar scientists around the world. So I think the one thing that I leave behind as a contribution is the fact that we actually now have people that are interested in the space and have begun to work on enteric infections and their consequences. So I'm going to be walking you through one part of my journey, which is the work on rotavirus and particularly the Indian rotavirus story. Rotavirus is known to occur in both humans and animals. The human story starts in Australia, where Ruth Bishop looked down an electron microscope and saw that there were wheel-shaped particles in biopsies of children that had intractable diarrhea. She was able to identify those particles. They were originally called duovirus because people thought that they had a double-layered shell. We now know that it is a triple-layered shell and rotaviruses are the commonest cause of acute gastroenteritis in humans, in cows, in horses, in birds. If you can find an animal and look for it when it is young, chances are if it has diarrhea, it'll be a rotavirus. So rotaviruses are 
common in every part of the world. We call the rotavirus a democratic virus because it affects the entire population. The problem with rotavirus and with diarrhea in general is that if you go around the world and you talk about diarrhea, people either don't recognize that it is a problem or they think it is really easily treatable because of oral rehydration solution. The problem, of course, is that viral gastroenteritis is different from bacterial gastroenteritis, which is what oral rehydration solution was made for, because in viral gastroenteritis, you get the diarrhea, but you also get vomiting. So when you have vomiting, it becomes very hard to rehydrate a child. So if you're leaking fluid at both ends and you have a large surface area, which is what happens to babies, they can dehydrate and die very quickly if you can't get to care. Sometimes if you get to care really late, it can be very hard to find an IV in a child. So people put IVs into the scalp, into bones in the leg, all sorts of efforts to try and get fluid into children which are not always successful. So it's, you know, as I said, rotavirus is a democratic virus. It affects everybody in the world and hygiene delays but does not prevent infection. And this is a reason when rotavirus vaccines were first introduced, the first country that they were introduced were was in the US. It is a virus that, you know, where IV fluids can help solve the problem. And as I said, if you can't get to IV fluids, children will die. So lots of people talk about diarrhea and say, well, why not water and sanitation? And water and sanitation do help. But if I was to rank order pathogens for which water and sanitation are most effective, it is bacteria first, parasites second, and then viruses. Now, rotavirus vaccines have been in development from the 1970s onwards. There were a lot of different approaches that were taken to development of vaccines. Uh, we followed the Janarian principle, which is to take an animal virus, put it into humans in the hope that it would prevent a human disease. But the first vaccine that was licensed was licensed in 1998. It was the Rotashield vaccine made by Wyeth and Al Kapikian, who is shown here, was a long-term scientist at the NIH who developed this vaccine. This vaccine was really interesting because it had a human virus backbone. I'm sorry, it had a monkey virus backbone and on the surface of it, there were genes that had been taken from human viruses and put on top because at that time, we thought that the diversity of rotaviruses would require a multivalent vaccine, much like influenza. Rotavirus, like flu, has a segmented genome. So before rotaviruses were introduced, this was the pattern of diarrheal diseases around the world. This is 1998, before vaccines were introduced. Now, does it make sense to introduce the vaccine into the US first? Well, it happened. The vaccine had been evaluated in about 10,000 children in clinical trials. It was rolled out very rapidly. It was given to American children. After about a million and a half doses of these vaccines were given out, they identified an association between the vaccine and a condition called intersusception, which is a telescoping of one part of the gut into another part. When this was identified, the vaccine was withdrawn in early 1999, and subsequently trials were all designed to be large enough to look at the effect of intersusception. 
So if you look at the figures that are shown on top on the left-hand side, what you see there is that when you have the intersusception in association with the vaccine, it usually occurs after the first dose of vaccine and in the first week after the first dose. So a defined period and a defined event, which actually makes it reasonably easy to identify that this event is associated with vaccination. Now, at the time that the vaccine was introduced and then withdrawn, there were a lot of discussions around the world because rotavirus was killing about half a million children annually around the world. Most of the deaths, as I showed you, were occur occurring in Asia and in Africa. So people said, if this is uh, an identifiable event, occurs within a defined time frame, why don't we go ahead and use the vaccine in any case? Because we will save many more lives than will be lost due to intersusception. This was discussed at the NIH, it was discussed at WHO, and then it came to the countries that were supposed to implement this vaccine, and the countries said, there is absolutely no chance that if there is a vaccine that has been rejected for American children, that we will use it in our country. So that led to new vaccines being developed, new trials needing to be done instead of 10,000 children as was done for Rotashield. Now the trials had 60 to 70,000 infants that were enrolled. The trials um, were completed and the two vaccines made by GlaxoSmithKline and Merck were both licensed in 2006. The vaccines when they were introduced were three dose and two dose vaccines. Didn't matter which one you got, it cost $200 to vaccinate a child in the US. It actually costs a bit more than that in the US now. So if these vaccines were to be introduced in India, I did a back of the envelope calculation at the time, it meant that we would use about 70% of our entire government health budget on one vaccine for our population. So obviously that wasn't a vaccine that was going to work for us. Nonetheless, these two vaccines came into the private sector and they came in at something that was only affordable for people who could afford private health care. These were effective vaccines, 85% and 95% efficacy. They were different from each other. One was a monovalent vaccine based on a human strain. The other was a bovine human reassortant, unlike the rhesus human reassortant that had been withdrawn. So moving now to the Indian vaccine story, um, we had been doing surveillance in India through a network that was sponsored by the Indian Council for Medical Research. Shown here are all the sites where we were conducting these uh, studies, looking to see what proportion of hospitalized gastroenteritis was due to rotavirus. And essentially, two out of every five children that were hospitalized in India had rotavirus. We did those hospital-based studies, we did community-based studies, and this is what we wound up calculating as a burden of disease for children in India. So in 2011, the birth cohort was about 27 million children, and we looked at what would happen to them over a period of two years, and essentially, one in two children would develop a rotavirus infection, one in eight would have a diarrhea that was severe enough to take them to outpatients. One in 30 children would be hospitalized and one in about 650 children would die because of a rotavirus gastroenteritis. So based on this, we knew that we needed a vaccine, but we couldn't afford $200 a dose. And then the question was, given this history of oral polio vaccines needing multiple doses, would we have a vaccine that would work in India? 
So India and the US had an Indo-US vaccine action plan that had been there since 1987, and it had supported vaccine development of an Indian vaccine that was based on a neonatal strain that had been identified by Dr. Bhan, who was a pediatrician at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. This was serendipitous. WHO had given him a kit. He needed to find stool samples. He thought the neonatal nursery was a good place to look. And then he found in children that were asymptomatic that there was a lot of rotavirus there. He then followed up those children and then looked to see whether they developed diarrhea subsequently or not and showed that the children who had had a neonatal infection had fewer attacks of rotavirus gastroenteritis. So this served as the basis of thinking that this neonatal strain might be a potential vaccine candidate. If you had exposure to the strain that didn't cause disease, would it actually prevent disease? So this was taken under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program. It came to the US. It was characterized here. Phase one studies were done in adults and in children. And in 1999, after Rotashield was withdrawn in the US, a, a company was identified in India to take vaccine development forward. And this was Bharat Biotech, a company that has grown substantially since then, but they were naive. They had never made a live viral vaccine before. It took them a really long time to get started, but they finally made the lots that allowed us to do clinical studies in India. By the time it got to be time to do the phase three studies that showed us whether the vaccine would work or not, uh, there were already vaccines that were available in the Indian market. The Merck and GSK vaccines were available there. So then we had this question, could you do a placebo-controlled trial? So we had consultations with bioethicists around the world and finally with WHO and had this recommendation that said that we could go ahead and do this trial but we had to make sure that the kids that were in, in that trial were as safe as we could possibly make them. That meant that every family got a cell phone with the numbers of the study team and they could call us for any problem their child had at any time. So essentially for two and a half years, none of us slept. It was a big team and all of us were on call all the time. And we wound up with a vaccine that had 55% efficacy. This vaccine was licensed by the Indian regulatory authorities in 2014, and this vaccine, which had been funded by the Gates Foundation, uh, was under an agreement where it would cost only one US dollar a dose. So this made it something that our program could afford. Unlike the US, where the price of vaccines has gone up, in India, this vaccine for public programs now costs 60 cents a dose. Now, the big question was, I told you 85, 95% efficacy of the Merck and GSK vaccine. So if you have a trial that shows you only 55% efficacy, that looks bad. But we had been doing work looking for a correlate of protection for rotavirus for a really long time. And in the work that we had done, we had shown that comparing cohorts across Mexico, India, and Africa, that protection from prior exposure to rotavirus was going to be incomplete. And we had predicted that the vaccine would have about 50% efficacy. Still good, but not as good as the vaccines in the West. But the one thing that I will point out to you is that this kind of study of natural infections gives you good information that comes from local regions, 
But the most important thing is what lower efficacy really means in developing countries. So here I'm showing you data not from the vaccine we worked on, but data from the GSK vaccine evaluated. Let's just take the example of Malawi and South Africa. In Malawi, the vaccine had 50%. The GSK vaccine had 50% efficacy. In South Africa, it had 77% efficacy. But if you look at the background rates of infection, in Malawi, if you followed 100 children for a year, 13 of them would develop severe rotavirus gastroenteritis. If you followed 100 South African children for a year, only five of them would develop a severe rotavirus gastroenteritis. So if the purpose of a vaccine is to reduce disease, with 50% efficacy in Malawi, because of the high rates of infection, actually you prevent about seven episodes of severe rotavirus gastroenteritis, whereas in South Africa, you only prevent four episodes of severe rotavirus gastroenteritis, despite the fact that the calculated vaccine efficacy is much higher in South Africa. So we had shown our Indian technical um, advisory group on immunization that there was a significant uh, disease burden. They wanted cost-effectiveness studies. They wanted WHO to recommend the vaccines. And finally, they wanted to know whether use of the vaccine would promote equity for the population. It's interesting that rotavirus vaccines were available, were recommended, were being used in the private sector from 2008 onwards, that the rotavirus vaccine was recommended for use for the entire population only in 2015. And in 2016, we were able to introduce the vaccine, initially starting at 9% of our birth cohort, but in, by 2019, taking that vaccine countrywide. India has now 25 million children born every year, and 90% of them receive the rotavirus vaccine. We also worked on a second Indian rotavirus vaccine. This was a product, again, made at the NIH, came in under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, was developed by the Serum Institute of India. This one was evaluated both in Africa and in India. It had higher efficacy in Niger than it did in India. This was a heat-stable vaccine, could be kept outside of the cold chain. And with these two vaccines, we finally had enough to vaccinate our entire country. So, these were the first phase three studies that were done in India. And it's interesting that the two companies that made those vaccines uh, have grown to become one, the most innovative company making vaccines in India, which is Bharat Biotech. They have the largest portfolio of vaccines and Serum is the biggest producer of vaccines in the world. So it was a privilege to work with them and to work with international collaborators. All of us learned a lot through that process. And we also learned that, you know, when there are setbacks, there are always people that you will find who will help you out. I'd just like to compare vaccine introduction in the UK and India. And I can take two examples here. If you look at the measles vaccine, that was introduced in the UK in 1968. It was introduced in India in 1986. And after that, India did not introduce a new vaccine until 2009, which is when we introduced the Haemophilus influenza type B vaccine as part of the pentavalent vaccine. Since then, we've introduced a number of vaccines, including the rotavirus and the pneumococcal vaccines. I'd just like to illustrate something to you. The gap, which was 20 years for vaccine introductions in rich and poor countries, 
has been changed over time because of one organization, and that's Gavi. It was founded in 2000 to address vaccine inequity, to make sure that kids in developing countries also got vaccines. But what I'd like to show you here, and I'd like you to do this exercise. You have the same color as a solid line and a dotted or a dashed line. So if we take a look, let's say, at PCV Gavi countries, you can see that the Gavi countries, the dotted lines, the dashed lines, always start later than the high-income countries, which are the solid lines, right? If you look at PCV and rota vaccines, what you can see is that though we might have started later in developing countries, our coverage is actually higher than high-income countries. That was not the case for HPV vaccines. HPV, we started late, we are staying low. Why is that? Well, HPV isn't made by a developing country vaccine manufacturer as yet. Serum has just started to make HPV vaccines, and I hope that we will have the same pattern as we have had for the other vaccines happen for this as well. So I'd like you to now compare the upper map and the lower map. You can see that things have changed a lot. But our job isn't quite done yet. We still have a long way to go when it comes to preventing disease deaths due to diarrhea in Asia and in Africa. Now, just to leave you with this figure, in 2018, as was pointed out, the two Indian vaccines both became pre-qualified. And I was really, really pleased when last year's figures came out for Gavi's purchase of vaccines. And now three quarters of Gavi's needs for vaccines are being met by Serum Institute of India and Bharat Biotech. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you to the institution that I worked in, the people that I've worked with, but mostly to the children that participated in our studies and their families.